immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him, Zeta, while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them, walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately, he spoke to them and said, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down. They were completely amazed for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored there. As soon as they got out of the boat, people recognized Jesus. They ran throughout that whole region and carried the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages, towns, or countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. Love God. Love, love your neighbor. Okay. The title of my message is Jesus Walks on the Water. Key verse, verse 52. Let's read the verse 52 together. Okay, let's go. For they had not understood about the laws. Their hearts were hardened. So I made a subtitle, Is my heart hardened? So let's uh, think about what this means. Okay. Let me pray briefly. Heavenly Father, as we study Mark's Gospel, chapter 6, open our eyes and make our heart softened so that we may be responsive to your word. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. At the center of Mark's gospel is a Jesus revealing the identity as the Son of God and the failure of his disciples to fully grasp that identity. This pattern repeats again and again. So for example, Jesus feeds the 5,000 in the previous passage, and the disciples' hearts were hardened. Next, Jesus will feed the 4,000 in chapter 8, but disciples still did not understand. And in chapter 8, Jesus healing the blind man at Bethsaida occurs in two stages. When Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes the first time, the blind man could not see clearly. People looked like trees walking around. After Jesus put his hands on the eyes a second time, he saw everything clearly. So this signifies the picture of these two cycles of events in chapter 6 through 8, and results in the disciples finally understanding who Jesus is. You are the Messiah. Jesus healed their blindness. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. We'll slowly learn that lesson. But remember this outline as we study next two chapters. Today, Jesus reveals himself as the creator God by walking on the water. No human beings can walk on the water. But Jesus' disciples were not yet spiritually walk. Look at verse 45. Immediately Jesus made disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. Here Jesus compared his disciples forcefully to get into the boat because he sensed a crisis. According to John's Gospel, the crowd was very excited about the miracle that they, they wanted to make Jesus king by force. They were excited that finally the Messiah came and would solve all their problems. Their bread problem, their job problem, their 
marriage problem, their family problems, mm -hmm. and they did not understand the purpose of Jesus coming to this world. Mm -hmm. When Jesus came the first time, he had no political agenda. He had no social agenda. He had no moral agenda. He only had spiritual agenda. He came to the earth you know, to offer salvation, you know, to offer eternal life. He would be a king, but he would be a spiritual king over the hearts of those who put their faith in him. One day, he will be the king of kings and lord of lords. He will reign over the, all the kingdoms of the world. But right now, his kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. But the people, however, wanted only physical things. They wanted only things which were momentary and temporal. They were, they were eager to receive Jesus' power over demons, disease, and death. His power to create food was even more attractive to them. They wanted him to solve all their physical problems. But Jesus saw the crowd for what the crowd was. He saw in the eager crowds no true worship, no true repentance, and their own sense of self-righteousness. They wanted their religion, but they loved their self-righteousness. They just wanted things Jesus could provide them. Furthermore, even his own disciples did not understand the significance of Jesus' miracle. But they were just excited about the prospect of Jesus becoming very popular and Jesus establishing the earthly Messianic kingdom. And they would be the cabinet members. So they were swept away by the crowd's excitement. So that is why Jesus made his disciples get into the boat. So after sending all his disciples, Jesus dismissed the crowd, went, went up on a mountainside to pray. He must have prayed for his disciples to pass through this, this spiritual crisis by renewing humble dependence on him. He must have prayed for the strength and wisdom to serve God's mission. Jesus, the Son of God, showed us his example that he depended on God in prayer. So we have no excuse to not to pray. Are you busy? Jesus was far more busy. busy. Are, you, are you tired? Jesus must have been exhausted. Are you in a crisis? Jesus was in a midst of crisis. So as prayer was essential to Jesus, it must be to us as well. Look at verses 47 and 48a. Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. The disciples were in the middle of the lake, and Jesus was alone on land. This separation lasted for some time. Evening probably started at 6 p.m., and it lasted until before dawn. It means that the disciples struggled on the lake for about 10 hours. You know, Lake Galilee is not that big. And it would take only two hours to cross from one end to the other. But they were struggling for 10 hours. They were struggling and fighting against the wind and not making any progress. They must have done their best. You know, they were better than fishermen. Mm -hmm. They rode hard until their muscles ached. They must have organized into teams and taking turns. But no matter how hard they struggled, they did not make any progress at all. They were still in the middle of the lake. They felt that they were going nowhere. So without Jesus, the disciples were going nowhere. They must have complained and despaired. However, Jesus did not abandon them. Jesus was watching the disciples from the mountain. 
So let's remember that Jesus told his disciples to go ahead of him to Bethsaida. They were trying to obey Jesus' words. They have done their best to follow Jesus' instruction. But they were going nowhere. This tells us that the disciples of Jesus, more than human effort to complete their obedience to Jesus' commands. With the human effort, we can get to the middle of the lake, but not to the other side. Jesus helped the disciples learn this through experience. Have you ever experienced that no matter how much you try, you cannot make any progress? It can be your homework or your PhD study. You know, there's one person right now who is struggling and no, making no progress. Or it can be raising disciples. It's very frustrating. So for example, last week we learned Jesus commanded us, you give them something to eat. So we want, we want to obey this command. So then we began to invite students to Bible study. However, we have met rejection after rejection, or we have begun Bible study with a student, but that person does not seem to grow at all. Our Bible student is stuck, and so are we. So after struggling, we become tired, and we complain to Jesus, where are you, Jesus? And Jesus seemed to abandon us. Jesus seemed far away. But Jesus is watching over us. So Jesus saw that the disciples had had enough. So he decided to go out to them. Look at verse 48. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them. No human being can walk on the water. But Jesus walked on water. Jesus is God who created the heavens and the earth. Here, I want you to notice this phrase, Jesus was about to pass by them. So think about that. Jesus was about to pass by them. It does not mean that he was going to bypass them. He's going to just bypass them without helping them. So there are many interpretations on this phrase, but the best interpretation I, I can see is that Jesus is trying to show them that he is God Almighty in the sense of the Old Testament. There are at least two occurrences where God Almighty intentionally passed by individuals. So on Mount Sinai, God passed by Moses. Exodus chapter 33 says, When my glory passes by, I'll put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I pass by. Then I'll remove my hand and you'll see my back. My, my face must not be seen. So in this passage, God reveals himself to Moses. Something of his nature and character is made known by passing him by. In another instance, God reveals himself before Elijah on Mount Horeb. First King chapter 19 says, The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not there. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. After the fire came a gentle whisper. So one lesson you can learn is that God does not come through earthquake or strong wind or fire. He came through gentle whisper. But here, God passed by Elijah. 
So Mark, the author, is intentionally linking this episode to those where God reveals himself to Moses and Elijah. So by walking on the water, Jesus is showing himself to possess power and authority as the creator. So he's proclaiming that he is the God of Moses and God of Elijah. So how did they respond? Did they welcome Jesus saying, wow, it's Jesus, welcome. We are so glad to see you, Master. No, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. They thought the ghost would come and grab them and go down to the depth of the sea. So they cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. So they, when they were struggling with their own effort, they did not see Jesus as Jesus, but as a ghost. You know, even if Jesus were a ghost, they did not need to be terrified. You know, in the previous passage, they drove out demons. So they could have cast out demons and subdued the demons. But they yelled in terror. So moreover, according to the Jewish myth, ghosts cannot walk on the water. The Jewish leaders or Roman readers of Mark's gospel must have been dumbfounded by the disciples' misunderstanding. Their idea that someone walking on the water was a ghost was comically illogical mistake. So it shows their irrational fear. It shows that they had no confidence in themselves or their past experience. So without Christ, they were powerless and fearful. They did not cry out, save us Jesus, but they cried out in fear. They had no faith, no courage, no strength. So when we see this event from the disciples' point of view, we can sympathize with them. They had a hard time struggling against the wind for 10 hours. Moreover, as Mark tells it, Jesus deliberately let them their limit, reach their limit before intervening. So why did Jesus do that? Because Jesus is the expert disciple maker. Jesus tears down in order to build up. Jesus helps us realize our limits truly so that we can depend on him completely. So it was Jesus' one-sided grace to educate his disciples in this way. Still, Jesus did not want his disciples to remain in their awful self-realization and fear any longer. So the moment they came to the bottom of themselves, he helped them to see, to see himself. So look at verse 50. The, Immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. As soon as they cried out, Jesus spoke to them immediately. When Jesus spoke to them, they began to recognize him. It was through his word that they, would, they could restore their love relationship with him. So the phrase, don't be afraid, don't be afraid, is used 100 times from Genesis to Revelation. It is typically spoken as a word of assurance. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. So the lesson in training of the 12 is that if you belong to Jesus, you never need to fear, no matter how terrifying the circumstances. If you are with Jesus, you have nothing to fear. He will be a present help in the time of need. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10 says, Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. Look at verses 51 and 52. Then he climbed into the boat with them, 
and the wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the laws. Their hearts were hardened. So this is the unique part of Mark's gospel. So let's think about that uh, in detail. So when he says that their hearts were hardened, what he's saying is that their hearts were hard to realize the implications of just who Jesus is in the miracle of Jesus feeding the 5,000. For if they had realized it, then they would not have been, would not been surprised by him walking on the water. For them, the prior miracle of Jesus feeding the 5,000 was not enough for them to realize just how much power and authority Jesus had. So the hardening heart is like a similar to Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Remember in Exodus, when the step of Moses became a snake, Pharaoh saw it as a simple magician's trick that his magicians could easily reproduce. So his heart remained hardened to realize just who he, who he was dealing with. So he refused to let the Israelites go. So his heart would not allow the truth about who he was dealing with to penetrate. A hardened heart is one that is hard to be penetrated with the truth and belief. So hardened, so how does one's heart become hardened? It can be, it can be because of our stubbornness or rebelliousness or simply not understanding the truth or it can be something else is in our hearts. So that's why Hebrew chapter 3 verse 15 says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. As you choose not to hear God, as you choose not to listen to the voice of God, or if we follow our own way, we become hardened to the message. If one has a hard heart, there is no biblical growth in his life. He cannot hear the voice of God. He cannot see the work of God. There is no spiritual growth, no desire to please God, no desire to serve God, and the disciples' hearts were hardened because of their vain hope of earthly messianic kingdom. So they could be somebody as a cabinet members in his, Jesus' kingdom. So even though they saw Jesus feeding the 5,000 and Jesus walking on the water, they could not make that connection. They were not spiritually walked. So Charles Spurgeon said, the same sun which melts the wax hardens the clay. The same gospel which melts some persons to repentance hardens others in their sins. But God is gracious and we need to pray and ask God for a new heart, a soft heart. And so we need to ask God to take away the stony heart. So that's why Ezekiel chapter 36 says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Changing our stony hearts involves humility, repentance, and obedience. So may God give you soft heart and be responsive to the word of God. Look at verses 50 through 56. As soon as Jesus got into the boat, he reached to the other side, landing at Gennesaret, just south of Capernaum. As soon as they got out of the boat, people recognized Jesus. News spread like a wildfire through the whole region. And people ran to Jesus from everywhere. They carried the sick on mass to wherever they heard he was. Probably they remember the friends of the paralytic. And some have carried their friends for one kilometer, some for 10 kilometers. And Jesus went into the villages, towns, 
and throughout the countryside, and wherever he went, people placed their sick on the marketplaces. And they begged Jesus to let them touch even the edge of cloth. And all who touched him were healed. Many of them had learned just touch free from the woman who had suffered from bleeding problem. So the main point of this part is that Jesus expresses love for all people by healing them. Jesus is the almighty God, but he expressed his power by healing many sick people. So in conclusion, so in this passage we learn that the disciples were hard or hardened because they did not understand Jesus' miracles. So we need to be very careful that our hearts do not become hardened, but be responsive mm -hmm. to God's word. So Father, thank you for Jesus who revealed himself as the creator God. May God help us open our eyes, open our ears, open our heart to see Jesus who he is. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so let's have a Q&A time. Do you have any question on today's passage? How do we know if our heart is hardened to something? That's a very good question. My heart is, is not res responsive to the word of God very closely. It means uh, my heart is hardened. Does that mean like when you listen to it, you don't you don't want to accept it or you don't like it or you you yeah, yeah, you yeah, angry? Yeah, yeah. So your heart is not actually willing to accept, and uh, my heart, our heart is very. Originally, it is not close to, to God's heart. That's the, our the reality. So mm -hmm. we need time to to be more responsive to the word of God. It, it takes time. So, you know, the, the is it meditation is like the, the, the cattle. In order to be fully digest as a real food, they need to chew difficultly to make uh, mm -hmm. really uh, eatable to them. Mm -hmm. So, like, like, likewise, we need to uh, spend the time to really digest the word of God. Mm -hmm. But when I hear immediately, I don't respond too much actually. Mm -hmm. But if I meditate on repeatedly, what it means, what it, what God's word is saying to me, then slowly, slowly, my heart is begin to respond. Mm -hmm. So, so the. In Second Peter, actually, Peter said, when we meditate on the word of God, mm -hmm. we should do until the dawn. The dawn, the word of God can be like a dawn, like, like a sun yeah, dawn. To, to, in, in our hearts. Mm -hmm. Until that time, we have to consider the word of God continually. Yeah. Like a disciples, when you are when you are fear, mm -hmm. when you are fearful, that means that your heart is hardened. Because that means that you are not accepting God's peace. Mm -hmm. what, what the Bible says, don't be afraid. Mm -hmm. Or you, when you are fearful, or when you have no peace, mm -hmm. you're restless. Mm -hmm. That means uh, your heart is not, you are hardened. Yeah. Also, it's not just you know, the negative reactions. A lot of times our hearts are hardened when we have no reaction to God's word. Like it doesn't, like when we read, you know, or hear God's words and it doesn't move us in any direction, oh, or, that means that your heart is hard, like it's unresponsive. Okay, that's a good point. That's, yeah. that's right. Wow. Yeah, so like a stony heart. So stony heart, no response. Right? I speak from experience. Okay. So whenever I say, we say something, when we see, when you look at someone's face, no response at all, stony face, no, <laughs> no emotion. So that means that they have a stony heart. No response. Whenever we say something, it, their face is blank. So, so it's a, it's a struggle to have a soft heart. Jesus really struggled very hard to plant this truth in his disciples. Mm. So uh, anyway, so 
Calvin's question and uh, Sam's answer and so Mr. David's thank you for your answer and I hope you can really meditate on that this week. Let's pray that God may give us soft heart Amen. to be responsive Amen. to the word of God, mm -hmm. not harden your heart. I'm saying to one person, if you are stuck in your PhD study or any anything, don't be don't despair. Mm. So you have to that's that's the precise time you have to pray. Amen. Yeah? So that God may come and help you. Because you, that means that you cannot do it by yourself. You need help. You need someone to push behind. Because you cannot do it alone. Mm. You need Jesus.